good evening. It's good to be here. Thanks for, for having me. Appreciate uh, this really unique collaboration. It's exciting to see many different folks from different churches and to see uh, students and former students and friends. And so, uh, thank you again for coming. It is a rainy Wednesday evening. It's good to be here uh, to engage in this topic. It's a uh, really an honor. And it's always just something to be taken seriously by folks. And so, I think uh, I hope that we'll have a good conversation. And uh, in some ways, I feel like maybe I should begin by saying I'm, I'm in the middle of a week of teaching, so I'm kind of in classroom mode. I didn't intend for this to be an academic lecture, and it may feel that way at points, uh, but I would love for you to, if you roll your eyes or nod off in, in there, it will make me feel at home, like you're in class <laughs> And I'll be reminded that this isn't a classroom lecture, and I'll try to, try to maybe break it up here and there. I used to, uh, for a few years before I was in the academy, I worked as a pastor, and I used to read my sermons to my wife, uh, like, on a Saturday evening, and say, how is this going, what do you think? And she would say, very, with very encouraging words, oh, honey, that's a really nice academic lecture. It's not a very good sermon. And, uh, so then I'd have to go and do that. And so here I am. But, um, so, and I'm really, I'm really grateful to be here. And so we're going to jump right in. And I think it will... There's no way to really soften the blow. We're going to kind of look at some pretty heavy topics, but I think because we don't have a, a ton of time, I'm going to try to be mindful of time uh, since we're tag teaming tonight. Um, I just want to really jump, jump in, but I really encourage you to, to take notes and write down questions if there's things that are unclear. Um, I'd love to engage uh, in just a little bit as we open into Q&A. So. so race, class, and reconciliation, where to begin? Let's see if I can get the clicker to work. Maybe not so much it was working. How about if we can advance the first slide? And maybe some, somehow this will begin working in there. So there's, there's just three questions I want to address tonight, and we have hardly any time to do any of them sufficiently. But that said, this is kind of a mountain of a topic. So we're going to kind of just move around and take a few perspectives. Uh, but I hope that in looking at these three questions, uh, we'll at least have some good material to discuss together. The first one we're going to look at is, uh, how are race and class interdependently linked? Right? How are these issues connected? Sometimes people want to pull these issues apart and say, oh, we just have a race issue, or we just have a class issue. But what we're going to try to examine today are the ways in which these things are actually inseparable. Uh, they go together. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at some examples of this connection locally. So we'll uh, talk about things like residential segregation of Seattle Public Schools. I have, a, I have a kid in Seattle Public Schools, and so we'll talk some about that. Uh, and then lastly, and this is probably the most crucial piece, uh, so we'll try to make time for this, uh, we're going to talk about a Christian vision for reconciliation. I have a teach in the School of Theology and like to think that uh, theology matters. Theology matters for, for our lives, for our communities, and certainly for this topic. So we'll try to look at some of the contours of that vision and say, can this provide us with uh, a way forward? Can this help us uh, to get our footing, to, to look ahead towards something hopeful? Okay. And since this still isn't working, I guess I'll just say slide. Oh, there it is. There we go. So I'm going to start with a, a little excerpt from a wonderful documentary that uh, was, it's getting a little bit dated, but I still recommend it. If you've, how many of you have seen Race, the Poverty, and Illusion? I would guess a few, a few of you at least. Um, it's pretty well done. I really like it. There's a couple of excerpts that we'll look at. This one comes from uh, a Berkeley Law professor named John Powell. And, uh, and he's talking a little bit about this photo that you see in the banner above, about uh, Jim Crow, right? regulation, the legal segregation that existed in the South for so many decades. And he said, at one point, we had explicit laws that said whites are on top and blacks are on the bottom. Today, we have many of the same practices without the explicit language. Right? We don't have these water fountains anymore, um, and yet somehow our society still seems to be structured in these ways. Those practices are largely inscribed in geography. So geography does the work of Jim Crow laws. Many people are confused why after 50 years of civil rights are our schools, our housing markets, and our jobs still segregated. A lot of this is a function of how we've re-inscribed the racial geographic space in the United States. That structure is still what we're looking at today. What he's saying here, essentially, is that even though the formal structures of Jim Crow, right, separate lunch counters, separate bathrooms, separate swimming pools, and so forth, even though that has gone away uh, under the law, there are still some patterns, some vestiges of Jim Crow still alive and functioning among us. And the way this happens is in geography, in urban geography, 
the locations of our homes and our schools, how freeways and railroad tracks and how all these things work together to perpetuate some of these patterns. And so I want to look at an example of, of what this is, an example of how this might, um, you know, uh, be, more, be a little more concrete. If you can see, some of you who know the area might know, what, what city are we looking at? There's some clues. If you see along that dividing line, this is, so maybe you should know what you're looking at. This is a, a census map. It's a demographic census map that's broken into racial categories over an urban area. And right on kind of the center here, that dividing line between green dots, green dots which represent uh, black population and the blue dots which represent the white population, seems to be a dividing line. I think the resolution is up. Can, you, can anybody read that? What's that say? can't read it. It says Eight Mile Road. So Eight Mile Road is not just a movie uh, that uh, starred Eminem about his uh, rise to stardom and his life from the trailer parks to uh, you know, success uh, in hip hop. Uh, Eight Mile Road is a real road. So uh, I was born in uh, just outside of Detroit. My parents were born in Detroit as well. If any of you have spent some time in Detroit, uh, you know it is a chocolate city, so to speak. It is a segregated city. And Eight Mile Road, historically, is one of those dividing lines. It's a, a line that is a, a physical line, right? It's a, 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 it's a kind of four, sometimes six lane road. It's a pretty, pretty big road. But it's also much more than just a physical divider. It's a racial, cultural, social divider. Uh, between these two communities. Some of the history of this wall, uh, if you were to, there's a picture of the wall, and I still don't know if my clicker is doing anything or if we're going to advance, but there's the wall. So this is a physical wall that exists along that road today. It is now kind of, uh, at the various points, it's a couple miles long with the park on one side, there's homes on the other. Back in the 1940s, uh, there was a lot of real estate development happening at the time. And there were developers who wanted to build just on the north side of Eight Mile Road. Um, and they wanted, they needed a federal backing from the uh, Federal Housing Administration to underwrite these loans so that they could begin this, what was going to become uh, a suburban development, which was fairly new at the time on the, in the American urban landscape. Uh, the banks looked at the area and they said, well, we would give you these loans, except we think you're a little too close to that black community. And uh, so what the developers did is they built a wall. Uh, they built a wall right along the road, dividing north and south. And once the wall was built, you can see it's not a huge wall, it's cinder blocks, it's concrete, it's about six feet uh, tall and a couple feet thick. Uh, once they built the wall, all the mortgages and loans on the north side of the wall were approved. And, uh, and that was very common practice for the Federal Housing Administration at that time. And what you can see, as you can probably imagine, is that the quality of life on either side of this wall, like all walls that we tend to build in our cities, whether they're in Palestine or Berlin or in our own cities, and whether or not there's even a physical wall there, as a signified divider, uh, the quality of life on either side is very different. And so we see kind of a racial divide and a class divide. A divide that's not just about culture and difference in language, but also about wealth and economics and therefore uh, power and capital and political resources and so forth. So one more uh, quote to maybe drive this home as far as how race and class converge. And I would say this one also comes from Race and Power of an Illusion. It's really just uh, the <coughs> clearest statement around how something like the locations of our homes, the homes that we live in, uh, literally are the um, kind of the location where race and class meet. This is what Dalton Connolly, a sociologist at NYU, says, the vast, ooh, come back. the vast majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in home equity. That's their nest egg. That's how they finance the education of their offspring and save up for retirement. They're living in their savings bank. Today, the average black family has only one-eighth, one-eighth the net worth. Think about that for a second. One-eighth the net worth of the average white family. And that difference has only grown since the 1960s. It is the legacy of racial inequality from generations past. No other measure captures the cumulative advantage of race for whites than wealth. So this is a much larger and complex problem than we have to unpack at the moment. But I would just suggest to you uh, that the racial differences that exist between us, and not only between black and white, but as using this as an example, 
um, are not just individual problems, not just problems of personal prejudice or, or personal animosity. Uh, one of my colleagues at SPU often says that the most common mistake we make as North Americans in thinking about race and racial conflict is that we think it's only a one-to-one -one and individual kind of issue. Or we're having some kind of misunderstanding, but I'm not prejudiced and you're not prejudiced so we can work it out and nobody's racist and we can all feel better about ourselves. Uh, but the problem, right, is that in a post-Jim Crow world, a world constructed like Detroit and like many of our cities around the country, racism is not just an individual one-to-one -one problem. It spills over into all these systems and structures that are really hard to pinpoint. Who do we blame? How do we, how do we get to the root of these problems? Uh, I would venture a guess to say most of the folks who lived on either side of Eight Mile Road, who lived there in the 1940s and who lived there now today, for the most part, do not harbor personal racial hatred against one another, and yet they're participating in systems uh, that determine class and social economic outcomes based on racial categories, right? And so we can never separate these things uh, from one another. Now, uh, maybe you think, well, that's Detroit, and Detroit is just, uh, Detroit's in the news for all of its economic problems and it's kind of broken, you know, bank bankruptcy and whatnot, and you think, well, good thing we're, we're in good old Seattle. Seattle's in such a colorful and diverse part of the country. We're so progressive and friendly here. We don't, uh, we, we don't see color. We eat all different kinds of foods from all over the world. Um, and to be fair, the, the map of, of Detroit does look different than, than Seattle. And you could, if you map all the major cities in the U.S., you'd find that there are some, um, there are some real stark contrasts. Um, but Seattle is far from, you know, this very idyllic multicultural island. If you look at the map here, uh, you, it's kind of hard to see because all the dots are clustered together, but you do see division. Uh, we live in a segregated city. I think that's part of just the reality of all North American cities. And yet I want to talk about how this division plays out in another kind of class and race-based system, and it's in public schools. So again, part of this perhaps is my own working out of some challenges that I'm working through because my, my uh, six-year-old son is in uh, Kimball Elementary on Beacon Hill, which we're very, very excited about. Any Kimball Cougars in the house? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so Kimball is our, our neighborhood school. It's a Title I school. It's a, a, a great school that we've really enjoyed so far. A lot of challenges, a lot of needs, but a lot of great families, a lot of people really invested in it as well. So we've been really pleased uh, with our experience there. And yet, the reality of public schools uh, is not just one where people happen to go where they want and everyone has equal access to the same kind of education. We know that there's a very particular history around racial division in public schools and where people live and where they end up going to school. And Seattle really is ground zero uh, for how race is used in assigning kids to public schools. Some of you may have been around uh, during the seven-year lawsuit that began. So I want to, I don't have a ton of time to get through this, so I'm going to move quickly. But I want to just outline for you some of the highlights of how this occurred and how in Seattle, geography became one of the determining, determining factors by which students had access to good schools or did not have access and the implications there. So it is the 60th anniversary, this, this year was the 60th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, I'd encourage some of you to look up, there's a great UCLA study uh, looking, you know, 60 years ago, looking uh, back at Brown versus Board of Education, which was this landmark ruling where the forced integration in schools across the country. This UCLA study was trying to examine the questions of whether or not we've made good progress since, uh, since 54. Any guesses uh, what this study at UCLA found around segregation in public schools? How are we doing? We're doing better, we're doing the same, we're doing worse. I'm seeing some thumbs down, some worse. We're, 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 we're doing worse. I'll leave that brown work to avoid education. Yeah, it's not, it's not such a rosy picture. To be fair, the demographics have shifted a lot since 54, and so there are some complex ways that we measure uh, school segregation and so forth. Uh, all that said, in Seattle, like in many other urban areas across the country, uh, we find a fairly disheartening result uh, many, many decades after Brown for Support of Education. And the reality is, really, it wasn't until the 70s that schools began to integrate, just because the law changed in 54 didn't mean the schools changed overnight. Uh, but that said, a lot of the research more or less shows 
uh, that schools have essentially resegregated to the same level of the mid 70s or are worse uh, today. And so this should be, I think this should be upsetting to us a, a little bit. I think that sometimes, and maybe it's just because I'm a Seattle Public Schools parent, I feel like this should be a little bit more on our, on our radar to say in cities like ours and cities across the country, uh, our promise of equal opportunity, uh, that regardless of your skin color, you can have a quality education, that these promises are, are just not being met. And that's a lot more, to, to meet that promise is more complex than it sounds. Uh, and yet, there are challenges for us uh, that remain really entrenched in residential segregation. Uh, this study was uh, from the Seattle Times in 2008, where they basically showed uh, the patterns uh, that were happening in the city were the same as elsewhere in the country. And so I'm going to move quick through the next. I'm going to skip through this one. This one talks about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, this court case, and this is what I was talking about. The Seattle's Ground Zero for it. This was. There was a control choice system um, after busing ended that was an attempt uh, to try to level the playing field. And so the policy up until fairly recently uh, was that if you lived in the city limits, if you lived in my neighborhood, uh, you didn't have to go to the neighborhood school, but there would be uh, spots reserved in other schools in the district so that if you wanted to, there was no guarantee that you would get your first choice, but that you could choose to go to a school outside of your neighborhood. I don't want to get into all the details of whether or not busing or the system was effective or not, but what's interesting is just that there was uh, one kind of person at the center of the, of the conflict, her name is Kathleen Rose, here she is, uh, in the article, she decided, uh, she lived in Queen Anne, she wanted her daughter to go to Ballard High School, and uh, her daughter did not get her first or second or third choice, uh, but was actually assigned to go to Franklin High School. Uh, Franklin High School is uh, where my kids would go if we stay at Seattle Public School. It's just up the street from where I live. Uh, she decided that it was not fair that her daughter did not get her first choices and did not want to send her to Franklin. And so she did what any well-resourced, well-intentioned, <laughs> intelligent, educated mother would do. And she lawyered up. Right? She got a whole... Uh, she gathered with other parents. She, she formed a, a, a kind of nonprofit called, um, I think it's a Parents Involved in Community Schools. Uh, it was a seven year lawsuit, essentially. There's a lot of things that I'm skipping over. Uh, but it, was, it went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And uh, split decision, 5 4. And uh, it was very close, but the court ruled in her favor and struck down uh, the racial tiebreaker that, you, that the Seattle Public Schools used. They used a the tiebreaker system basically as a a kind of balance to try to integrate uh, the control choice system. And uh, after that, it was kind of like a domino effect. What happened was uh, with the Supreme Court ruling that that racial tiebreaker policy uh, could no longer be used, uh, what happened was the inevitable uh, move toward back to the neighborhood schools began. And that's, and so that's where we are today. Uh, I would just say that part of the challenge, without getting into all the details of this case, <coughs> Uh, is that geography becomes destiny. Where you live uh, and who, where you can afford to live in particular, in Seattle, as we know, is a very expensive place to live, becomes the most determinative factor in what kind of school you can attend. And so if you can afford to live in an area where there's a very high quality school, uh, then, you know, then there's high competition, there's higher prices, there's more exclusivity, and there's access. Uh, but for many of us, without those points of access, uh, we're left with, with neighborhood schools. Those neighborhood schools certainly can improve and resources can be pumped into them. Um, and yet we see kind of in this example of the, uh, the kind of straitjacketed nature that race and class, what, what happens when communities are, are isolated from one another and when points of access are, are taken away from um, uh, whether by the law or by, by concerned citizens and so forth. To be fair to Kathleen, you know, I think that the, the logic, the logic of we want to stop racial discrimination by stop discriminating based on race in schools is internally sound and yet neglects this much, much larger picture of how these uh, systems and structures function when it comes to race and class. I'm going to keep going. I would encourage you to, I know that I've kind of jumped around there. I want to talk about reconciliation. <laughs> and so we're going to shift gears a little bit. But I put all that in the backdrop to say these are deeply challenging 
sometimes intractable issues. Um, and so we really need to wrestle with what it means to be faithful in this, in this context. This passage is one that gives me hope, uh, partly because what it addresses in this vision of Christian reconciliation is work in Christ that has already been done. And so we'll talk in just a minute about this reality that reconciliation is, is already done and yet not yet fully done. Uh, this passage is about the reconciliation in the, it's about reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles in the early church, and it would be difficult to overstate the ethnic and cultural division between Jews and Gentiles uh, in this context. Right? And yet, this is exactly the kind of cultural, uh, racial tension, if you will, that Paul, as a pastor and church planner, is trying to wrestle through uh, with the church in Ephesus. And this is what he says as he's trying to address. Uh, a divided congregation there. He says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles uh, were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Uh, this is you and I. We are, we are Gentiles. We are outsiders. We are foreigners and strangers, estranged from God and estranged from one another. Um, and yet something very unique, something very essential has happened in the person of Jesus, in that that estrangement, that foreignness, that outsider status that was formerly a part of who we were, is being eradicated right, in the person of Jesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier of the dividing wall of hostility. This is a well-worn passage. I imagine you've heard this read or preached or you've read it or preached it yourself on many occasions. And yet, this reality of Christ in his body creating a new humanity is something that I'm not sure we've fully wrestled with. This reality that the, the cultural markers of the world somehow get collapsed inside the person and body of Jesus. Right? That somehow a new humanity is being born, a new humanity in which the social logics of race uh, no longer apply. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Right? That Christ's body is uh, Christ's body, of which we are people who are in Christ, right? are, are all part of the body, and we participate in the demolishing and in the crossing of these boundaries and dividing walls, the walls that are built. Uh, in Detroit and in our own cities and around the world. Consequently, you are no longer, come back, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, right? We're no longer outsiders and strangers from one another, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This idea of being no longer estranged, but instead members of God's household, says that essentially we're like family. Our, our family lines have been redrawn. We're not, uh, we're not kinship by blood, and yet in Christ's body, the, the relational markers that once defined us right, are, are redefined. Uh, we're no longer estranged from one another, but our citizenship has been remapped. Right? Our citizenship is no longer uh, allegiance only to an earthly municipality, but instead is uh, part of a much larger realm in the kingdom of God, uh, and a new family being born in Christ's body. Part of this idea, as we think about reconciliation, this already but not yet reality, if I can skip one more slide, um, oh, go back, one more. So, there we are. So I just I want to conclude with a few a few thoughts on the journey of reconciliation because uh, there's so much to take into consideration. First, as I alluded to earlier, reconciliation is already but not yet. If you read this passage in Ephesians, Paul speaks in the present tense. Right? He speaks about what has already been accomplished in Christ's body. We are no longer estranged. We're no longer outsiders. We're no longer. Uh, at each other's throats in hostility, but instead, in Christ's body, we have already been reconciled. And yet, if that's the case, then why, why, is, there so much, why is there so much conflict and tension still to work through? Right? This is the, 
the not yet of the journey of reconciliation. If you want to sound really intelligent, you can talk about eschatological tension, right? There's a tension in reconciliation that Christ has already done the work, um, and yet we have the challenge of, of living into it, of pressing our lives further into this reality so that we can see the fruit of it in, in the present time. So reconciliation has already occurred, and that's the good news, is that Jesus has done the work, right? And we have, if you are in Christ, you're a new creation, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And that work is already done, and yet there is also this not yet peace, right? We live in this in-between of trying to figure out how do we live into the reality of Christ's body that has already broken down these walls between us. Uh, secondly, I want to say that reconciliation is costly and it's mutually transformative. It's not this cheap, shallow version of multiculturalism. Some have said that uh, it's not at all clear that Christians are actually ready to engage uh, the real work of reconciliation. We like the word a lot, uh, and yet the work itself is much harder to do. I think sometimes uh, we want to put, a, put together a potluck, sing some different songs together, cry on each other's shoulders, um, say some prayers, bring some things together, and, and kind of wash our hands of it and say, Ooh, that was good. I am glad we are now reconciling Christ. And yet this is a very, very long, messy, costly process. When we've done that, nothing against the potlucks and the crying on each other's shoulders and the sharing of meals and everything. I think that's always a good place to begin. Uh, and yet if we remain there, uh, we haven't actually done the real work of reconciliation. It always costs us something. Um, and, and part of this work in mutual transformation uh, is really uncomfortable. It's really challenging as we do the work. And if we're going to really be about the work of reconciliation, then we have to commit to this process of after the potluck's over, of saying, how do we work on this public school issue? How do we talk about um, inequity in our systems, in our geography, um, in our laws that still remain? And that kind of takes us into this last reflection, if we're truly committed to reconciliation, we will face opposition. I think if we do, if we practice a form of reconciliation that everyone, you know, has a, a lovely international dish and is on their way, then I think we haven't, we haven't done the work. And I want to just suggest to you that the structures of segregation, the logic of, of sameness, of homogeneity that really defines our cities and our geography, that these are enforced by very powerful forces. The politics of fear, the logic of capitalism, there's a lot of other things that work there. But there are many, many people and institutions, structures and principalities that will work against this idea of reconciliation, at least reconciliation in its holistic and truest form. One that crosses class boundaries and begins to say, how can we interrogate these economic systems that are not just and that work along racial patterns? Even though that's a bit of a discouragement, uh, that the real reconciliation work will be challenging, I hope that there's also something encouraging that thanks be to God uh, that the spirit empowered church is stronger than these forces of fear. And it may not always seem that way, it may not always feel uh, like the Holy Spirit is at work in the work that we, um, in, in all this reconciliation work that we're trying to be a part of. And yet, I really do believe uh, that where we find the work of the Holy Spirit poured out on men and women from every tongue and tribe and nation. Uh, that somehow we catch glimpses of the already. All right? We catch glimpses of this people coming together across hostility and somehow working together on these, on these um, really deeply intractable issues. And so I pray that you know, as we move forward that we'll think about the role of the Spirit in reconciliation. This isn't an intellectual process. This isn't just something we can learn about and solve, I think really the Holy Spirit is the, the great facilitator in this reconciliation work that we need to do. So I want to end with a quote from uh, Willie Jennings, uh, who wrote a wonderful book called The Christian Imagination. And there's more here again than we can unpack, but I'll leave you with some stuff to chew on. He says, the identity is being formed in the space of communion. It's a theme in the book he talks about communion as this uh, place of belonging and intimacy where people who were estranged from one another somehow find commonality. Uh, the space of communion may become a direct challenge to the geographic patterns forced upon peoples by the capitalistic logic of real estate. We who live in the new space of joining may need to transgress the boundaries of real estate by buying where we should not 
and living where we must not, by living together where we supposedly cannot, and being identified with those whom we should not. For us in the racial world, the remade world, the crucial point of discipleship is precisely global real estate. The story of race is also the story of place. So I would encourage you to, to keep an open mind and an open heart, and uh, as we keep talking tonight, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Liz, and I'm excited to, to continue to unpack this, and I uh, really appreciate your time, and look forward to talking further this evening.